Thank you. Very wonderful. I appreciate that. I, uh, before I get started on what I want to hit on in the notes, I want to say something reference the other night that Dan, I think it was Dan that was up here leading the meeting, and he was honoring family. And forgive me, I don't want to be too blubbery, but, uh, um, you know, while he was doing that, I, for my own journey, I was thinking of the last couple of verses in the Old Testament where it talked about how God was going to come through the covenant that he was bringing in Jesus to turn the hearts to family, fathers to children, children to fathers, obviously parents to family. And the whole time uh, God was honoring uh, through Dan and different ones, the family here, I just wanted to say, uh, honor them as well. Um, couldn't help but thinking about my, sorry, I'm so weepy, I didn't intend on doing this, but my, my third daughter, Kelsey, got four daughters, the, uh, she's married to Tom's son. And while they were honoring this family, I was thinking of my daughter, Kelsey. Um, you know, family's a, a great thing. It's, it's, it's got tremendous blessing. It's got challenge to it. How I many of us know that? You know, I, I say it like this. The greatest blessing of family is they're always there. Yes. They got your back. They stand with you. The greatest challenge of family is they're always there. <laughs> You got weird Uncle Charlie, you know, that says the inappropriate things. You've got Sister Sarah that brings her agenda into the family meal. And there's a, there's a tremendous treasure of family, but it's an earthen vessel. And uh, back to my daughter, Kelsey. She, she's a social worker. When, and when she was doing her internship in social work, she would come home and do things she had never done before. She'd walk into the house and come up and hug us and say, thank you so much for the way you raised me. And uh, at first, I was getting kind of nervous because I thought, wow, am I dying? Is Denise dying? <laughs> and she, would, she did it many times. And I thought, what, what is going on? Why are you thanking us, you know? She said, well, Dad, I, the people that I'm in school with have terrible family life. And then the, pe the clients I go out to help have awful family life. And I just, it never dawned on me. How precious, I mean, I always appreciated my family, but it never dawned on me how precious they were. And I'm a little like Kelsey coming into this family. Uh, I've been here about 10 years, but we had other families. <laughs> and uh, the amount of godly family life I see in this place, this family, I'm so glad God joined us here. Got to understand, even though we've got our challenges and uh, we got our weird Uncle Harry's and stuff like that, <laughs> there is a family here that loves us. I appreciate the way that uh, the fathers and mothers have stood here, Jeanette and Barney and Lorraine and Steve, Chris and Dave and many others. You've stood for this family. And I'm thankful I got to come in and be a part of it. Amen. And to see the multi-generational dimension of young people getting up like that, I guess you're not so young now, but you started out young. And honoring fathers and honoring mothers. I'm going to say this. This family's great. This family's great. And I thank you all for being a family. And then I see Mrs. O'Connell come in. And you know what? Isn't that great that she's here? On this issue of family, my wife went through breast cancer as well. And, and I remember moments when I was sinking in despair. And it was like the hand of the Lord came and lifted me up. Because I knew you guys we're praying for us. It was weird. It was like the hand of the Lord, but I knew in those hands was the prayers of this family as well as people in the state. So I, isn't it great? Family's good. Can you just say family's good? Family's Can you turn to the person that is the weird Uncle Harold to you in this family <laughs> and say family's good? Just find him. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what we're going to talk about this morning, Andy, Andy told me not to yell, and my default mode is to yell, so it may, makes it theme, seem like I know what I'm saying. No, no, it's not true. But, but I do want to talk about this. Hasn't this been a blessing? I've been very encouraged and energized being here. Last night was tremendous, wasn't it? I tell you what, E4 evangelists do something to you that you can't get anywhere else. I've known that with Glenn Middleton. When he comes around people and, and equips us and talks, people are like, I can do this. I can do this. That's the wonderful impartation. of Ephesians 4 evangelists don't try to impress you with what they know or do, but they're encouraging you so that we can do it. Isn't that cool? And I liked that last night. But I want to talk about this thing in your notes, the gospel, the power of God, what's essentials, and what's packaging. 
And where I want to go with this is I want to us to appreciate, honor, work with the culture God's given us and where we're at, but we don't want to lose the real gospel as we do it. We're very, very big in the States right now about being culturally relevant. And that is important. But there's a line there that we've got to be careful of because we can become so culturally relevant that we become irrelevant to the gospel. I want to be culturally relevant, but I don't want to be kingdom irrelevant. And so some of the things I'm going to share with you this morning are going to have that edge in it. I appreciate the theme of this conference with Acts 17. Uh, if you have Bibles, could you open there? I've got some. Uh, I just want to read the first six verses. It's not in the notes, but I'd like to read it. This has always been a favorite passage of mine and one I've aspired to attain to. In Acts chapter 17, it talks about their coming to Thessalonica. And it says this, they came to Thessalonica, pardon me, this is a terrible thing to say, does anybody have a Kleenex? I didn't mean to get all blubbery up here. Andy, is this a good time to yell? Okay, thanks, okay, hallelujah, sorry. But it says, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and according to Paul's custom, he went into them and reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Folks, we're going to see this in Acts 17, the three places it hits. There was a reasoning that was based on Scripture. Okay, We cannot forget that. I want to use stories and I want to use examples in culture. But ultimately, the truth God revealed to us in His Word is the Gospel. Okay, And I'll, I'll use the stories and the movies, but there is the Gospel that comes from the Word of God alone. He reasoned with them in three Sabbaths opening and setting forth that Christ must have suffered and to have risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. Yes. And some of them believed and joined themselves to Paul and Silas, but a great multitude of the worshiping Greeks, and not a few of the chief women. But the disobeying Jews became jealous, and having taken aside some wicked men of the market, loafers, and gathered a crowd, they set all the city in an uproar. And coming to the house of Jason, they sought to bring them out to the mob. And not finding them, they drew Jason and certain brothers before the city judges crying. Now this is, I'll get loud here because they actually were crying out, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's someone named Jesus ruling. I like that. Now, I, I must confess, I did the math. Uh, in, in my, I, I was a first-generation Christian in my family, and for the years I've served God, I've been to over 2,000 corporate gatherings of God's people. That's a, that's a small estimate. It's probably been more because I went to conferences. I have never had this happen. And I've been to many of, of your, your towns and places. I've never had anybody get upset that I had attended a meeting or been to a meeting or been with Christians. Now, some of you have, and you're heroes in the faith. But for myself, it's, it's almost like, oh, yeah, <laughs> he's going to a meeting or coming from a meeting. Now, I don't wish this kind of stuff, but I, I know this about Jesus. Everywhere he went, there was a reaction. People were either glad or they were mad. But never were they just, oh, indifferent. And I look at this example of the early church, how they were spreading, and we're in an Acts 17 time, we feel like. I long for this kind of, not that we have the riots, but there's the kind of impact where people take note of the lifestyles of God's people, the messages of God's people, and somehow it affects them. Some will be glad. There will probably be some that are mad. But we want to fight indifference. And our influence is not yelling. I know I, I can be a yeller. It's not about yelling, but it's about seeing the demonstration of the gospel in the lives of His people. And then announcing that out of those lives that are living it. And to me, the impact when I look at this thing, it's, I think the key there is, they're acting different. Why are they acting different? Because there's another one ruling. 
and his name is Jesus. I want my life to demonstrate that. I want it to be spoken through my life and then articulated by the gospel. Does this make sense? That's what we're aiming for, the influence of God in the earth. Now the gospel, in your notes, the gospel is the good news of everything God has done and is doing in Jesus Christ. I like that. It's not just what he did, but it's also what he's doing, because what he's doing comes out of what he's done. And I'm thankful for that. That's the gospel. It's mentioned over a hundred times in the Bible. I love Romans chapter 1 in your notes, verse 15. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel. And I've got in your notes everything. This is important because I think it presses up against culture. And what I'm going at this morning, what I'm going after is not just the cultures we work in, but how many of you know there's a Christian culture? And that can be just as much of a problem as the secular culture that we live in. And so I'm kind of going after both. I'll probably end up hitting the Christian culture (laughs) as much as anything. But I want you to know it says everything connected to the gospel is in Christ. We've got to understand that. It's not in a decision. It's in Jesus Himself. And we have far too much decisional Christianity and decisional salvations. Folks, I I know I'm not the greatest scholar in the world. And then Michael spoke last night and I thought, what happened to my brain? (laughs) But but I'm not the smartest guy in the world. But as an unbeliever, I, I lived 20 years without the Lord. When I found out that salvation was in Jesus, guess where I wanted to be? See, see we can't separate salvation from Jesus. Salvation isn't a thing. It's Jesus. He is my righteousness. He is my salvation. He is my redemption. He is my sanctification. It is in Christ. And we have way too much decisional Christianity. Does this make sense to you? I don't want it. I, I, I was, I'll, I'll use some examples. I'm watching the clock here. But I, I was out, this was last summer, just kind of hit this thing with me. I was out on a prayer walk, and there was this young man sitting on a bench. And so I stopped, I greeted him, and he seemed like there was an openness. So I started talking to him. It was early in the morning. He had just gotten out of jail. Great, great time. I'm prayer walking. He just got out of jail. Hallelujah. <laughs> So I bent down and started talking to him, and he explains his situation. Uh, obviously, he had some problems with alcohol and, and drugs, and, and uh, family dis, uh, dysfunction was great. And I said, well, you know what, David, I, you know, I ha- I've had problems with alcohol and drugs in my life, and I know a lot of people that have been in similar situations to you. The, you know what set us free? And he goes, what? I said, we began to follow Jesus, and somehow that power came, and it restored us, and First thing out of his mouth, he goes, oh, I, I made a decision for him seven years ago. <laughs> now, understand, in the story he just told me, he's been in jail five times since the seven-year-ago decision. <laughs> I'm, not the most sharp, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but it's like something's not lining up here. <laughs> My first inclination is, David, what did you decide to do? when you made your decision. And I asked him that. He's like, well, I, I believed in him. I said, okay, okay, hold, hold on a second. You've got to understand. I don't know what people told you there. But freedom is in Jesus. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then you'll be disciples of mine. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I said, the freedom that I got is because I've, I've, I met Jesus, I gave myself to him, and I began to follow him. And as I did, he delivered me. David, you need more than a decision. You need to become a disciple. You need to start following Jesus. He, he kind of, and I said, you know what? The family thing that you're going to go face right now, I'll pray with you about it, but you've got to follow Jesus. I knelt down and I prayed with him, went on. But that highlighted to me this idea, if we're not careful, we can lead people to a decision, but that doesn't mean they're in Christ or they're disciples. We've got to talk about that. Does this make sense to you? It's very important. Now, Acts 17, the, in your notes, understanding the times we live in. In 1 Chronicles, it talks about the sons of Issachar. They were a tribe that understood the times and knew what the people of God 
should do. And I thought Michael did a brilliant, what a brilliant job. I want to go, I've only heard that guy once in a debate. And I've never heard him preach. So that was like eye-opening to me. I just thought, wow. But didn't he help us articulate the cultural issues that many of us are facing? There may be slight differences, but that was a great overall thing. We need to understand those things to get an idea of what God's people should do and how we respond to that. And in Acts chapter 17, we have, it's, it's a great story because it follows through Three different places where Paul was at. You've got Thessalonica, Berea, and then you've got Athens. And in these situations, you, you see a great example of Paul doing, what, or Paul doing what he said in Ephesians where he talks about God came and preached peace to those who are far away and those who are near. You see both classifications of people in that Acts 17 experience. He went into a couple of synagogues, well, three synagogues, reasoned with them, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, they were people near. They were Jews and they were God-fearing Greeks. People that had an appreciation for the Word of God already some, in some way, shape, or form. I want you to know something. We've got to be able to go to the people near. That didn't mean they were Christians. They were just people that were near. And then you see people far away when he goes to Athens and he speaks with the philosophers and the polytheistic people that had a lot of different gods. But it's a great example of how we reach both groups. And here's what I found in, in, in our situations that, that, that we find ourselves in. Sometimes people that you think are far away are nearer than you thought. <laughs> I, that sounds weird, but I had that happen to me the day before I came. There was this guy that, that uh, I, I live in a small town of 18,000 people. So it's not like I can have these great stories of people and not know what happened to their life. Does that make sense? I know what happens after they pray because I, I live in the same town. Okay, so one of my favorite places that I go is, is our local YMCA. It's an exercise place, and there's where I do a lot of my, have a lot of my opportunities to share the gospel with people. Well, sometimes <laughs> I've had people that I thought, you know, I've talked to them and talked to them and talked to them, and it's like, my goodness, it's a closed off wall. And then there are those moments where you realize, oh, he's not so far away as I thought he was. I had this guy the, the other day, it's, it's like I'm, I'm talking to him, and all of a sudden he, he, he just opens himself and says, well, what do you think God thinks about this? And this was a guy that it's like it's, it's been a wrestling match with a bear. I just have to back off. And then all of a sudden he's open. But anyway, we've got to discern, okay, far away near, God enables us and equips us to reach both. And I like that about Acts 17 because we can get instruction and ideas about what's good to do this, all right? Now, the importance in your notes of a scripturally based gospel. I already referred to this, but we must be able to reason with and examine from scripture about the gospel of Jesus, okay? Sometimes in our current attempts to contextualize and enculturate the message, the message gets lost, the biblical message. And what I liked about Paul is he used scriptures to both people far and near. Even in Athens, he reasoned in the synagogue, but then he went out and reasoned. He's got the scriptures fresh in his reasoning in the synagogue, and then when he goes out into the public arena, he's still reasoning. He does use their gods. He does use their poets. But he's also got the scriptures, which is guiding his reasoning process. And I thought, Michael, man, wasn't he brilliant in that, the way he could do that? I mean, I, I just, man, I got really inspired. But we've got to be able to, you, you've got the Thessalonians who were kind of near, you've got the Bereans which were near, Paul reasoned with them, they went home and reasoned to make sure what he was saying was scriptural. In Athens you had both the people in the synagogue as well as the people in the marketplace. But all of them, Paul was reasoning from the scriptural basis, the scriptural understanding, even as he used cultural narratives and cultural ideas. Does this make sense, okay? Now, in that, this next section, individual and cultural ideas we need to be aware of. This is something that I know many of you have done for years. I found it very helpful when I'm trying to reach into the culture to both people who are far and near away or far and near to Christ in the gospel. There's a worldview grid. We've, we've used it for years. You may have better ones than this, but everyone has ideas from their own lives and cultures about where they came from, what the problem is, what can be done to fix the problem, and then basically, how do we know what's right and wrong? 
Those are, that's a good little worldview grid that, that I like to use. Two days before I came, I was getting some tires done, and, and uh, I was trying to, you know, give a blessing. That's obviously a great way to come in. We're called to be a blessing. So there was a guy, I mean, he was under tremendous pressure, and, you know, people are mad, and, you know, it's that kind of environment. And I go up and said, man, I am so glad I got you to wait on me. I've seen you before. I said, you, you have this way about you. That even though people are always criticizing you and stuff like that, you're, you're very competent. And he's like, you know, he was writing, and then all of a sudden he's like, huh? He's, he doesn't hear blessing, so you give him a blessing. But we enter into this conversation, and the first thing, he, third thing he goes, you know what? People just aren't like this anymore. And then I get to discern his worldview grit. He said, I said, I know, isn't culture gotten bad? Oh, it has. You know, <laughs> and then, it, well, here was his world. What's the problem? Well, people don't make enough money. <laughs> Immediately, I'm trying to discern his worldview grid. But I keep talking to him, keep blessing him, keep turning him towards Christ. But we need to be aware of people's worldview grid. Sometimes you can see it in the culture. Sometimes they have a personal worldview grid, even in the midst of the culture. But it's important if we're going to reach them that we have a sense and discernment by Holy Spirit so we can guide them and turn them to Christ and His design and His ideal. It's important that we have an appreciation for the cultural understanding that people have. And what we want to do, it's not just so I know their worldview grid, but Michael exemplified this so perfectly, it's so I can start at their worldview and then take it in to the solution and God's only answer, which is through Jesus. That's the only reason. I'm, we're not just studying worldviews so that people, we understand how people think. It's to show them that, you know what, you're identifying something, but here may be the deeper source and the ultimate fulfillment of the real problem. And that's why we need to have an appreciation towards culture and towards how people think. Now, what I did here in your notes, I'm not going to go over these, but I gave you the gospel presentations in the book of Acts. And there's several of them you'll see down there. But the interesting thing about those gospel presentations is that the apostles and, and, and the disciples, they began with either what people knew or an experience they had, and then what they knew in light of that experience. Does that make sense? For some, it was an experience they saw where people came out of the upper room and they were noised abroad. They were worshiping God, a great noise. And then, you know what, he started, with, hey, you see this? Of course, people are saying, they're drunk. He says, no, they're not drunk like you think they're drunk. They may be drunk, but they're not like that. That's my own interpretation. They've been drinking something else. And then he starts with that. He starts with that happening and experience, and then he pulls it back into Scripture. This is what the, the prophet Joel spoke, and then he testifies of the gospel. And then he, then he doesn't leave it there. He says, just make a decision for the Lord. No. <laughs> what do we do? Repent, be baptized the name of Jesus, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But all through the book of Acts, you find them either beginning with the scriptural revelation they have or with a happening. I want the happenings too. I want where we lay hands on people. Isn't it exciting when you're out there on the street? And it's like sometimes you don't know what to do, but it's like, well, I know what, I can pray for them. I remember one time walking up uh, behind my wife, and she was praying for the single, single mom. And uh, I just kind of came up on her as she was talking to her, just the point of praying with her. And my wife, you know, she's very kind and stuff, <laughs> unlike me, and uh, gets her into great situations. But I walked up as she was saying, would you mind if I prayed for you? And I watched this girl's, I was, I was behind my wife, and I watched this girl's face. And I thought, I'm going to keep my eyes open here to see what happens, you know. And my wife, in her gentle way, said, can I just put my hand on you? Yeah. But the funny thing in this girl's face, she's never has, had anybody ask about prayer before. Isn't it crazy? I mean, you'd think in Midwest United States. She, says, she didn't know what to do. She says, I don't know. After my wife asked her, can I pray? I don't know. I, I've never had anybody ask me that. And then, then she's like, I guess. And my wife says, well, I'm just going to reach out and put my hand on you. Watch this girl's face. And then she's like, no, this lady's touching me. I don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, I saw the power of God come on her. And then, then it's like she's starting to blink. And then she, she kind of ducks her head. And then my wife plays this very simple but godly prayer for this lady. And then she like, I'm, I, I kept my eyes open. She's like, whoa. That felt great. <laughs> she said, and then the, only, the next thing, she, I think people should do this more. 
<laughs> I thought, yeah. So we may get a happening. Something happens supernaturally that we can point to. Or an under, I, I, I want to I catch an Ethiopian eunuch sometime. I mean, I want that deal. You see at the end, it's like, you're reading Isaiah? Where did you get Isaiah? You know? And it's like you begin from what they know or what they're experiencing, and then you lead them on through into the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. Makes sense? Now, let's talk about this next section, moving in the power of the gospel. This is important. Moving in the power of the gospel. I wrote here, there is power in the gospel message itself and delivering power connected to it. The gospel entails supernatural power because it's a supernatural gospel. And we're on a supernatural mission. It's, not, it's going to be more... I thought Michael, again, did a great job last night instilling the idea of the power that's in the gospel. It's not just us. It's in the gospel itself. And I like 1 Corinthians 4. I, I won't read all these, but it says, God's kingdom is not just a lot of words. It's power. I love that. Tom did a great job the other night hitting on that and stretching us towards that. Then I like 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in full conviction. Something Michael said really uh, struck me. Uh, <laughs> he said this, it's not in me to give power to the gospel. It's the gospel get, that gives power to our speech. Did that, did that not jack you up? I mean, it, it just, I thought, yes. I, I've got this saying with me. It's like sometimes I have to be, I know that. I, how many of you know that's true, what he said? But how many of you t tend to forget it? <laughs> okay. I'm not always like the great Glenn Middleton. You know, he's just bold all the time. There are times I just want to hide. <laughs> Where it's like I go out in public and I, it's like, oh, I, I hope nobody asks me about Jesus because I, like, I don't feel like I measure up to even talking about him today. Do you, no, none of you probably have that thing, but sometimes I'm like the old, you know, the people that are kind of perverted. They just want to duck away, and, and you know what? Here's what I found. It's usually when I feel like that when the door opens up. And so I need to be reminded afresh that the power is in the gospel. It's not just me giving the gospel power. Does this make, make sense to you? I mean, my goodness, some of my best times, I should know. I mean, I've been serving God for over 30 years. I should know when I'm feeling bad, it's like that's the best time to preach the gospel because that's when the opportunities usually come. I had, again, the day before I left, this one guy, I, I've talked to this guy. I mean, he's, he, he's strange. All right. Again, I see him. I see him at least once or twice a week. He he's a, a agnostic, you know, and he thinks I'm stupid, but he thinks I'm nice. But he thinks I'm smart, but he thinks I'm dumb. I mean, it's one of those kind of things. And it's like you seem like a nice guy, you know, or you seem like. Have you ever heard anybody do this to you? You seem like you're kind of intelligent. What he's not saying is, why do you believe this stuff? So I saw him, and I was in. I, I was stressed out trying to come here. Everything wasn't going great. I wasn't on top of the world. And I'm walking out, and there he is. And I'm like, oh, man, I hope he doesn't. I, I, I was nice and greeted him with a smile. Then all of a sudden, boom, there it is. He says, hey, I know you believe this stuff. He goes, just tell me how come you think this is real for you. Where did that come from? I've wrestled with this guy. I've talked to him. It's like he's, he's, he's made me think I'm stupid and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, oh, so. Oh, so. Now all of a sudden I went from feeling like I don't want to say anything or see anybody to Superman. It's like, you know what? The power is in the gospel. So I, I, I clearly laid out. I used the Nicodemus thing about being born again. I described what happened to me when I gave my heart to Christ and when he came and ruled. And I, and, and I said, and it's in those moments God met me. And, and I look over at him after I'm saying this, and he's like, oh, Wow. Now, he didn't have me pray for him, but I, but I did describe to him. I said, you know what? In order to get this experience, you have to turn away from how you're living and give your life to Christ and begin to follow him. But it was when I felt the worst. And that's always that way for me. Can I tell you one more story? I'll, I'll, I will get the, you might like this. You're from England, okay? But I, I joined, a, uh, I joined a, a professional speech club in our, in our town. We have a university there. And I wanted to get around business people and stuff like that. So I, I figured, okay, I can, I can talk and this will help me, but then it will give me an opportunity. Now there's university professors, exchange students, businessmen in this. 
And I go in there and I'll, I, you know, I, I, usually I, I do the two-thirds uh, Christian stories and then one-third I do old police stories. Because I always like old police stories, you know, where you drive cars fast and run through signs and pull guns on people. <laughs> And so one night, <laughs> this club met at a time where it wasn't convenient, but I wanted to be in it, so I faithfully did it. And then one night, um, I got home late, and it's like, oh my, I had another meeting after the club. I thought, don't go, Doug. This, this, just don't go. And I'm sitting there going, I don't want to go to this. And it's like, oh man, Denise wasn't home. We had another meeting. I thought, oh, you know, so I went to the, I rode my motorcycle. I went to my motorcycle. All the time I'm feeling this dread. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And all the way there, every block, every intersection is like, turn around, turn around, turn around. And I get to this place, and nobody had showed up yet. And I thought, why didn't I listen to the leading of Doug? <laughs> Nobody's here. And then, then the, the guy, he's, uh, he's, he's the, he oversees the marketing of this company. He comes in, he says, oh, nobody's here. And I, inside, I'm going, no, this is crazy. And then another guy comes in that directs the whole thing. He's a university professor that does, works with international students. He looks in the room, and then him and this guy leave. I said, nobody's coming. Why am I here? They leave me there by myself. And while I'm sitting there, uh, an international student came in who's a Muslim, another businessman. I said, well, at least somebody showed up. Then they come back in the room, and they said, come here. I thought, oh my goodness. Again, I'm still thinking, get out of here. You don't want to be here. I walk up to him, and this guy looks at me and says, here's what we want you to do. The people that were supposed to speak tonight aren't showing up, but here, I want you, would you be willing to tell us why you believe in the Bible and that Jesus is who he says he is? <laughs> I thought I was in a dream, you know, in the jail. It's like, is this a dream? And, and it's like, are you kidding? They say, yeah, we want to do that. Would you be willing to do that? And I said, <laughs> Yeah, and all of a sudden, faith starts to rise up. I give up, gives this typical apologetic, talk about what Jesus did, why he's real, what he did in my life, why the Bible's true. I get done. This guy, the, the, the original guy that asked me, pulls me over to the corner. He said, that was really great. I love it when you tell me that. Now, understand, I love church history. I love British history. He goes, uh, and I talked to this guy before. He had been involved in a cult earlier. But here's what he says to me. He says, most of the people around here have never heard of this guy, but I wondered if you did. I'm a relative of his. His name's Charles Spurgeon. <laughs> I'm, I'm up against the wall. I said, what? He says, I, I know you probably never heard of him. I said, yes, I have heard of him. Said, yes, I have. He says, yeah, his, he had a brother, and my family lineage goes back to his brother. Well, all of a sudden, I'm like, I just preached the gospel to this guy. He's Charles Spurgeon's relative. I know Charles Spurgeon prayed for him, probably his brother. I think his brother was James or something. And I said, Tom. His name was Tom Spurgeon. <laughs> Tom. <laughs> so now I'm on gospel. It's like, do you understand? And I, again, took him through the gospel, what you've got to do. And he let me pray for him. Guys, the power's in the gospel. It's not in me. I mean, yes, the Holy Spirit's in me. But I don't give the gospel power. The gospel has power. Does that make sense to us? Let's have convictions about that as we go around. To me, to me, to me sometimes it's like, do you remember when in, in Samuel where the, the Philistines captured the Ark of God? And then they thought, we'll just keep it next in the te Temple of Dagon. Remember that? I use this little thing. I say, park the Ark next to the idols. And sometimes when you speak the gospel to people, you're parking the ark next to the idols. The next morning when they got up to check on it, the idol fell over, the head was off, the hands are off. Hallelujah. <laughs> Even if it doesn't feel like it, the power is in the gospel. Park it next to the idols. Even if you don't see it, maybe overnight, their head and hands will fall off. That doesn't sound good. Okay. <laughs> Our approach. <laughs> Our approach to the culture we're serving. We don't want to be pro-culture. We don't want to be anti-culture. We want to influence culture. Yes, yes. This is important. This is why we have, to, we, we have to be sure in how we're approaching this. All right? We've got to understand that we're either discipling our culture or our culture is discipling us. You know, there's principalities and powers that are making disciples right now. And we're called to make disciples. And when we lose our desire and courage to confront or speak to our culture. And we've got to do it with respect. But we've also got to realize there's another culture trying to influence them as well. And we need to step up to the plate. Does it, 
We understand this. Now, important questions we need to ask Holy Spirit to help us with in discerning so we can be culturally relevant while at the same time faithful to the gospel. I put three little questions that help me sometimes as I'm going into other cultures or trying to influence our culture. The first one is, what values does this culture have in an imperfect form that bears the faint image of the kingdom? We've got to understand, every culture has a faint reflection of the image of God in it. It's imperfect, it's twisted, but yet it's there and we need to look for it. We have a couple young men on our leadership team from Nigeria, and they have been the biggest blessing to us in bringing different cultural perspectives. And I'll have to say this, the African culture is a heck of a lot better than our culture in America at appreciating and understanding what God is like and how His kingdom works. And I'm thankful for that. A second thing we need to realize is what values does the culture have that most, most goes against the kingdom that we are prophetically critiquing and seeking to bring under the influence of God's ultimate solution, Jesus. Okay, so what's the good thing in culture? What's the twisted thing in culture? And then lastly, what methods are timely in helping communicate the gospel without distracting from the timeless truth? Okay, we want to be timely and culturally relevant, but we also want to make sure we're faithful to the timeless truth. Every culture has faint images of God. I mean, the United States, we've got lots of problems, all right? I understand that. But the faint image of God you see in the States is there is this thing called can-do attitude. I don't have it, but it's, it's in the States. <laughs> but the can-do attitude, it, it, do you understand, even that reflects an image of God. How many of you, go, how many of you know nothing's impossible to God? How many of you know all things? He can do anything. Now... Sometimes Dave, Dave and Chris are good about this. He says, I love being around you Americans. You have this attitude where you can do stuff. Now, there's a downside. The twist is we become like Donald Trump. And it, seriously, I mean, it's a good side, it's a bad side. Now, Danny did withdraw from being his campaign manager right before the meeting. <laughs> but, but it's the same thing. I remember the first time I... The first time I went to Sweden, and I sit down with a guy that had been one of the five uh, top guys in IKEA for many years, and we're sitting at a table. We have a young student, a young girl that's a student. We have him. We have a doctor, and we have uh, the two guys that are with me from the States. And he goes, he's used to dealing with Americans. And he goes, you Americans. It's kind of like the first time I met JB. He said, what is it with you Americans? The first thing you said to me in the car, that's what you said. And I'm like shrinking, man. It's like... <laughs> But, but this guy looked, he says, now, I want to show you something about Swedish culture. We're sitting at this table, and you've noticed that this girl is just as important as I am, and this doctor is, and you are, and everybody has an equal place at the table. I thought, how many of you know that's the image of God? God values every gift. There's no one thing that says it can be less important than the other. That's the good side. The faint image. The twist is everybody's the same and no one can break out and no one can go forward. We're all like that. I don't know what the deal is about the British culture. I think you're cynical. cynical? It's perfect. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, you've got to understand. <laughs> I find, now, seriously, you, you guys would look at this and say we're so cynical. Some, some of you do. But I, I find that refreshing. <laughs> you say, how come? Well, do you understand we live in the land of celebrity cult pastor worship? I mean, you, there's people that are just shams and con artists, but people are just drawn to the celebrity status. I like cynicism. It kind of like brings things down to reality. I know I'm twisted on that. <laughs> now, there's a downside to it. But do you understand, we need to appreciate the good side in culture, look to it, and try to use it to bring the gospel of Jesus. Now, this section here, I want to hit this one. The essentials, as we're trying to be culturally relevant, the essentials that we can't afford to see lost in our cultural packaging as we're trying to appeal to culture. Now, what I'm talking about when I talk about these essentials, they're not just the gospel itself, but they're the responses in light of the gospel. 
Do you understand the Bible has biblical responses to the gospel? That they're just as much God as the gospel? I know there's theologians here, and I may be in heresy, but think about that for a moment. There are biblical responses to the gospel that are the Word of God. And we don't want to lose those things. Because then things get watered down and we start getting discipled by the current popularity rather than discipled by Jesus or His Word. What are the essentials we can't afford to lose? The Lordship of Jesus. Come on, that was the first message. God has made Him both Lord and Savior, this Jesus whom you crucified. Over 7,000 times God's referred to as Lord. Only 37 times as Savior. And never personal Savior, like you can control Him. And He's your little thing to put in your pocket to give you good luck. He's Lord. And we need to make sure we're proclaiming that in a nice way, in a winsome way, but not be, let's not be mamby-pamby about it. He's Lord. And where I've seen this de-emphasized, you see, you don't see the gospel really taking root in people's lives. He's got to be Lord. A second thing we can't afford to lose is the idea of following Him as disciples. The call is to make disciples. Not decisions, not deciders, disciples. 269 times in the Scripture, God's people are referred to as disciples. Those that follow Jesus and learn to obey His Word. Only three times does it refer to us as Christians. And one of them is in Acts 11 where it says the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The clear emphasis is calling people to follow Jesus. Jesus himself, 25 times in the scripture, he says, follow me, come after me, here I'm, I'm going here, come on. Only four times does he say to believe in me. The, the emphasis is on making followers. If salvation is in Jesus, you need to be with and in Jesus. Not just in a decision. And that's the downside if we lose this in the midst of being culturally relevant. We're not going to make disciples. Right. We'll make people that have experiences and have made decisions, but that's not a disciple. Come on, if, if, if salvation is in Jesus, I want to be in Him. Yeah. That's, right. that's not just a mental image idea. Yeah. It's got to have reality in our lives. Yeah. You're looking strange. I hope I'm not messing up. I'll be corrected later. A third thing we can't afford to lose that's an essential is we're called to walk in community and in a family. I mean, it's in the natural order of things, but it's also in the spiritual order of God's life. You don't take a baby and just throw him out in the street. Glad you had the decision to come out of your mom's stomach. <laughs> you just throw him out in the street. Yeah, hope you make it. That doesn't happen. It doesn't work. And you look in, in, in Acts 2... The call of the first gospel message. It says this after Peter concluded his word. He said, let everybody know for sure God's made him Lord and Christ, this Jesus. And then it says, with many other words, many other words, he said, be saved from the perverse generation. What were the many words? I don't know all of them, but it resulted in them becoming disciples and walking together as a family of God. Those words need to be in the responses to the gospel. Make sense? A fourth thing is we've got to make sure that the mission of God is... We're not, we don't get people saved to come and watch a, a, a church program. They're saved to be on mission with God. Everyone, everywhere, every day, all the time, we're called on God to mission. These are essentials. I want to stop here as, as we close, but I, I just want to make that appeal because it's the gospel, it's the gospel responses. We need to make sure we're keeping those things true as we try to be culturally relevant, culturally relevant because we don't want to be kingdom relevant. And I've seen far too many times, right now in our culture, we're, we, in, in the United States, there's gospel messages that are going out there that are just not the gospel. They're just not. It's therapy, it's self-help, it's feeling good about myself, it's my emotions. But we want the biblical gospel. Amen? The biblical gospel. So can we pray this morning 
as I close, I just want us to pray. I feel like God's really met us. We're thinking bigger. We're, we're feeling that surge to go forward. Could God help us? Could God help us to be discerning as we're being relevant to make sure that we're presenting the clear gospel with Him? Could you stand your feet for just a moment here as we pray?